And people are filing in, but I thought we could just get started with some introductions and then Theo going over the ground rules or Theo has something to say before then. Yeah, I just wanted to let folks know that the meeting is going to be recorded. I'm going to record the introductions as well, as much as possible recorded. Um, so as soon as I stop talking, I'm going to hit record. So if anybody would like their name changed, let me know and I can do that or you can rename uh, by clicking on the ellipsis in the corner of your video and then click and rename. Um, but I'd be happy to do that for you as well. But I'm going to hit record now. Just want to let you know. Okay, so thank you, Theo. Um, I My name is Elliot Young. I'm one of the co-chairs along with Lakayana of PSEP. And if you are a PSEP member, if you could just write to me in the chat so I could know to get you to introduce yourself and we'll, I'll just call on people so it's easier. So Lakayana. Lakayana, he, him, pronouns, co-chair of PSEP. PSEP, um, also a member of the Race Equity Subcommittee. Kia. Hi, everyone. This is Kia Myers-Dugan. I am a PSEP member. Yes, we're very excited to have Kia. She's our newest member. Um, I think Anne is here as well. Anne, yes, Anne. Hi, everyone. Anne Campbell. I'm an alternate co-chair of the steering committee and a PSEP member. Thank you. And I see Vadim. Hi everybody, Vadim Mazursky. Thank you for attending this meeting. I look forward to hearing from everybody. And Amy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Anderson. I'm the chair of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. Okay, any other PSEP members here who I have not, who have not introduced themselves yet? Great. Um, Theo has already introduced himself, and I think Claudia is also here. Claudia, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia. I am the product assistant for PSA. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, so our fearless staff, without which um, very little of what we do can, can happen. Um, so the sole purpose of tonight is to focus on the Kokel report, third quarter report that um, Dennis Rosenbaum and his colleague um, Tom Kristoff and, and company have prepared for us. Um, I hope you all had a chance to see it over this past week and, and read through it. There have been some news reports summarizing it. Um, so the Order of events today will be um, Dennis and Tom will do a present, brief presentation about their report, and then we will have PSEP members and public um, engage in lively discussion and questions about the report. So I'll be facilitating the first half of this meeting, and then Lakiana, my brother and co chair, will take over the second half. So Without further ado, um, Dennis or Tom, I don't know which of you wants to start off. Or you should introduce uh, yourselves too. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Dennis Rosenbaum. I think I know most of you. Um, and Tom is here somewhere and he's gonna be on the agenda here soon. I think Tom has control of our PowerPoint, so I'll count on him for that. Um, and um, I just, Dennis, you, you want know- me to put it up now? Uh, in a minute, yeah, not not quite yet. Um, I just, you know, want to thank all of you for taking the time to participate in this uh, virtual town hall or whatever we want to call it. Um, it tells me that you care about the city of Portland, the people who live there, and the and the quality of police services. Um, you know, as someone who grew up in the Portland area there, and uh, I attended uh, high school there, Central Catholic High School on Stark Street. Uh, this project is quite a bit more to me than just a work assignment. It, it's personal. Um, I do care deeply about Portland community. I I have lots of family and friends there, so uh, it's it's been uh, an honor to do this, uh, and it's also been a challenge. Um, so, Tom, why don't you put up the PowerPoint so we can just go through some of the slides? And and uh, the first one I want to talk about is the the, the questions basically remain the same. I think it's the next slide after that. Um, 
you know, the, um, we have uh, the same questions in this maintenance year that we had before, you know, basically has the city and, and the Portland Police Bureau, which I will sometimes call PPB, uh, sustain the kind of systems that they needed for the reform during this maintenance year. Uh, for those of you who maybe weren't involved, I want you to recall that the, the police department, the Bureau achieved full compliance after five years uh, on January 10th of this year and, and had to remain in compliance for one year. Um, and we'll come back to that issue. Um, the question is, have they also continued to collect data and analysis to identify problems and trends uh, in use of force and other factors and provide feedback to themselves as a learning organization would do and to the public uh, as a transparent organization would do. And then have they continued to conduct self-evaluations and make adjustments as needed? And that, that's what I mean by feedback uh, to themselves. And clearly our assessment here is that unfortunately uh, the Portland Police Bureau was unable to remain in substantial compliance due to the problems with its use of force and its training systems. Um, in our last report, we promised to give you some assessment of PPB's response to the protests in our next report. We'll do that here in two ways. First, uh, we'll make some comments on the protests uh, in general, and then we'll look at how they've affected uh, PPB's ability to comply with the requirements of the settlement agreement. And um, we're not able to give a step-by-step analysis of each confrontation that's happened or a full pattern analysis because honestly we don't have all the adequate documentation on use of force and certain there are certain cases too as you know that are being pursued through investigations and lawsuits and that will take some time as well but um, before we delve into this I mean I guess I, I want to make one comment that, about adequate data uh, you know, I've said this from the first day I started on this project in Portland that uh, I've recommended that officers wear body cameras. And uh, I'll just say that, you know, Portland's the only community that in the country that I know where I've encountered stiff opposition to body cameras. But I'm not going to allow myself to get distracted by that now, except to say that um, body cameras are an excellent mechanism for increasing civility on both sides and holding the police accountable for their actions. And uh, uh, that's, that, that's really important. So uh, Tom, can you move on to the, I wanna give my, our perspective on the social justice protests here as we, uh, before we go much deeper because it has affected uh, the city and the Bureau and the community in a big way. Um, you know, we were hired for a specific purpose, as I just said, but with all the intense emotions and experiences around the protests, the shock, the anger, the fear, um, I do feel compelled to comment here and share our perspective. Um, there's no question that systemic racial injustice is deep in our national history. Um, and uh, clearly in Portland's history, I believe Oregon is the only state in the nation where uh, the original constitution prohibited blacks from living there. Uh, and not everything's gone away. You know, I grew up in Portland. I have many stories I could tell. My immediate family uh, today includes people of color. And I've been through a lot of experiences. Uh, I spent many years studying race prejudice and then race and policing and then police community relations. And uh, you know, honestly, the false rhetoric out of Washington, D.C. right now about the absence of bias in our society today is appalling and outrageous. Um, so um, clearly, the community not only has a constitutional right to protest, but arguably a moral obligation to do so when the injustice is blatant and persistent. And as I, as I said in our report, you know, civil disobedience um, and public demonstrations are designed to be painful and uncomfortable to those who don't see the problem. Uh, John Lewis pointed that out very clearly. Uh, but I really also want to emphasize that criminal violence of any type, whether it's by the community or the police, is inexcusable and should not be tolerated. Uh, you know, setting fires and taking down historic statues and breaking windows and writing graffiti on government buildings and stealing property even throwing dangerous objects at police officers, none of this should be tolerated. And 
many members of the community um, want the police to take firm action to enforce the law, believe it or not. And this is a safety issue and this type of violence and destruction undermines the social order for everyone. So I must say the events in Portland are extraordinary uh, with white nationals coming to town and the persistent tensions between the far left and the far right. Um, and with all this conflict and then with the, uh, the federal law enforcement coming there, the focus on local police reform, I think can easily get lost. I, you know, enforcement tactics by the Portland Police Bureau must be applied with good cause and reasonableness which hasn't always happened. Uh, we've seen some videos of police behavior that's disturbing. Um, you know, honestly, after I'm, I'm getting old and I've, I've been working with the, working and studying the police for 40 years and watching them in more than a hundred American cities. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a cop hater, I'm not a cop lover, uh, but I have pushed very hard for tangible reforms. Um, and you know, I've observed really great cops. I've observed horrible cops. I've observed well-managed police organizations and very poorly managed police organizations. And uh, you know, Portland is in a very unique situation today, and in a place that I haven't seen too many other departments. We've seen some in this year in the country. Other places face these difficult situations. And and, and I know many of you don't want me to say that, but. Clearly, on the one hand, they're being criticized heavily, and it turns out by recent surveys, four in 10 Oregonians uh, are claiming that police are not calling the violence and not being aggressive enough. And on the other hand, they're heavily criticized uh, in Portland uh, for being too aggressive and being harming the community. And, you know, uh, I, I can tell you, I certainly wouldn't want to be a cop today. Uh, it's a no win situation. I don't know too many people want their children to grow up or to, to, to apply to be cops because it's such a difficult situation. So I do have some compassion, but they also have to follow the rules. And uh, I'm sure if Portland Police Bureau could do it over again, they might have handled the protest differently. They certainly were caught off guard and had to learn a lot on the fly. But the only real question now is where we go from here. And I hope you will be part of that dialogue, which uh, certainly will take you beyond the work uh, that we've done. Um, you know, in this third quarter report, we looked at the protests and the pandemic primarily as they affected PPB's ability to comply with the terms of the settlement agreement. Uh, unfortunately, we found that PPB and the city failed to maintain substantial compliance during this maintenance year in terms of use of force and training. And we'll focus on those concerns tonight, although we'll cover all of the other areas. I don't know if you've gone on to the summary slide, uh, summarizing the compliance. Yes. Um, so there we have, we still find the city and the Portland Police Bureau in substantial compliance in five of the uh, seven areas. That's community-based mental health services, crisis intervention, employee information systems, officer accountability, and community engagement and a PSEP. We'll talk about each of those tonight briefly, but. They did not, in our opinion and our judgment based on the available evidence, uh, remain in substantial compliance mm -hmm. in use of force and training. So let's go on and uh, begin uh, our discussion. Um, I, I do wanna say though, before we, we go on, um, you know, for the, even the areas that we, I just mentioned that they, we feel they still have remained in compliance. We're very cognizant of the fact that nothing's perfect and, and they have fallen down in some of the specific tasks in those areas, in part because of the, the highly unusual circumstances they've been facing. But overall, we were satisfied that most of their system objectives have been achieved or they're well down the road toward uh, completing them. Uh, the two areas, again, where, they, where the problems are a little deeper are, uh, are problematic, but I think they can also some of those can be fixed in the near future. Uh, and we've recommended changes and we will tonight as well. But you might wanna ask, well, what does this non-compliance really mean? What, what happens next? Um, I'm gonna make a couple points here. This is our finding as the COCO. Um, it's, we're not the final decision maker, it turns out in the way things are structured in Portland. That role belongs to the US Department of Justice. 
Uh, and so DOJ has the final word uh, on whether the city has fallen out of compliance. And you know, in the past, they have used the evidence gathered by us, uh, the COCAL team, and uh, some of our analysis of compliance. But I want to stress that they also conduct their own independent investigation and will reach their own conclusions. Um, and if DOJ finds a city out of compliance, then there will be negotiations with the city about what happened, what does this mean, um, what has to be done exactly to restore substantial compliance, and what that time frame will be. I can't give you the answers to those because I don't know the answers at this moment in time. Their report is not in. It probably will be finished early in 2021, early January, but we don't know that for sure either. Um, so, um, but we have our own views of what compliance looks like and, and evidence that we have, and we have recommendations as well for making things better. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom uh, first, to talk about a few of the sections, and then I'll come back and, and talk more in a minute. Sure, thank you. Um, so looking at section three, uh, the use of force, um, we'll, we'll go through uh, some of the paragraphs where we had found uh, PPB and the city had maintained compliance um, before going into the, the paragraphs where we felt that they had fallen out of substantial compliance. Um, so for one of the things, they, they're required to do a quarter, quarterly analysis of force. Um, this is non-protest force. Um, there's issues with doing comparison of protest versus force versus non-protest force for their quarterly, quarterly analysis. What PPB does is at the annual, um, every year they do an annual um, analysis of protest force. So this is just uh, non-protest force. Um, but what we've seen is that the raw numbers of uses of force against individuals, uh, the number of individuals who have had force used against them, it's, it's consistent with prior trends, uh, 169 in the second quarter, um, we do see a increase in the force to custody rate. Uh, the reason for this is because of COVID-19, there's been a decrease in interactions, a decrease in arrests. Um, so while the raw number has uh, generally stayed consistent, uh, the, the number of overall interactions and arrests has decreased. And that, that's what would explain that, that increase to about 4.09%. Um, um, also in the in section three, uh, PBB is required to uh, maintain a supervisor's checklist. Uh, they do that through the after action report, um, which you'll see me uh, reference an AAR throughout this presentation. That's the after action report. And that's the supervisor when they're responding to uh, the scene of a use of force and they're reviewing officers uh, force data collection reports or FDCRs. The supervisor um, then fills out a after action report to evaluate the use of force event. Um, so they, they've maintained that uh, checklist through the after action report. Um, additionally, they've maintained their, uh, the patrol supervision staffing level. Um, presently, they have about 4.84 officers per supervisor, <coughs> excuse me, across the three main precincts. Um, Finally, we, we conducted a review of 20 non-protest force cases uh, to look at whether force is used, um, whether the force is documented comprehensively, whether it's reviewed comprehensively, and whether the force used was reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. And our review of those uh, 20 non-protest force uh, cases uh, covering category two, category three, and category four um, events, we, we did find that it was comprehensively documented, comprehensively reviewed, um, and reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. Um, where we had found that PPB in the city had fallen out of substantial compliance, um, one section is paragraph 66 through 69. This is uh, the requirement of officers to complete timely um, uh, force data collection reports, FDCRs, um, that have sufficient information for supervisors to uh, conduct a thorough review. Um, we were not provided sufficient documentation to assess these paragraphs. Uh, the, as the settlement agreement is set up, the burden of proof of uh, maintaining compliance falls on the city and PPB, um, and we were not provided uh, sufficient documentation. We were provided some FDCRs um, and AARs, 
um, but they weren't a sufficient representation of the protests. Um, because we didn't have that sufficient documentation, we were unable to determine the degree of whether sufficient information was found within the FDCRs. Um, we were unable to determine whether the FDCRs were uh, completed in a timely manner. Um, and as well as uh, we had found um, a we had found a use of force where an officer had uh, struck a community member with a hard object in the head. Uh, this was not categorized as lethal force. Um, and this uh, goes to the reporting required under FDCRs. Um, another set of uh, paragraphs in section three use of force um, are paragraph 70 and 73. Um, again, these are after action reports, uh, the requirement for supervisors to complete after action reports. And again, we, we did not have sufficient documentation uh, to be able to assess these paragraphs. Um, again, we, had, we were provided some after action reports, um, but not a sufficient representation um, of the protest events. Um, through our conversations with PPB, um, we also learned a couple of things that during the early parts of the protests, there were some after action reports that contained over 100 FDCRs per after action. This means that one supervisor would be responsible for reviewing over 100 FDCRs. Uh, as you can probably guess, this, this has some implications for whether a supervisor can conduct a thorough review of those FDCRs when there's so many of them. Um, we had also learned that during some of the early protest uh, days that after actions were not being completed within uh, 72 hours. Um, and this has implications for recall. Uh, interviewing an officer more than 72 hours later, uh, it, it calls into question uh, the reliability of what the officer can recall, uh, particularly if that officer then is going through the same types of events, the same protests, um, night after night um, and, and being able to remember details of that specific night and that specific use of force. When we, when we uh, are able to review uh, a representative sample of the after action reports, um, we'll, we'll look to see for evidence of these things, um, but we, we have some initial concerns uh, that, that uh, a, thorough review, a thorough review and recall might be impacted uh, by the number of FDCRs and the timeline. Um, we had also uh, found that the city had not maintained substantial compliance with respect to paragraph 74, 75, and 77. Um, this is, these are paragraphs related to auditing of use of force cases. Um, PPB has a extremely thorough audit. Um, and because of the thoroughness of the audit, uh, they were unable to, to provide the documentation of the after actions and of the FDCRs. The, the thoroughness of the audit caused these delays. Uh, we were informed in mid-August that no force events had gone through the full audit process uh, because there's issues with identifying uh, all the FDCRs that were a part of a force event, um, identifying all the after actions, making sure that all the information was gathered and in the in the hecticness of the first uh, you know few weeks of the protests, um, there was there was a lot of activity and, and PPB um, was still trying to identify um, all the FDCRs and all of the after actions. Um, and so what they did is in June they they decided to skip. Um, the force inspector reviewing protest force cases for the month of June so that they can ensure that the third quarter protest force events, that there will be a comprehensive reporting for the third quarter. Um, skipping June, however, is a violation of the, of the settlement agreement. Um, and so that's one of the things that we have found them out of compliance for for here. Um, because this impacts the ability of the force inspector to identify trends in a timely fashion, to be able to review the protest force events and identify trends uh, that can be used uh, to, to mitigate future uses of force or, or as a learning tool for the organization. Um, finally, um, 
one of the things that we had found was that for the overall force management, um, which we're required to evaluate under paragraph uh, 170, um, is the management of force. Um, one of the things that we had found was the, the totality of the protests um, overwhelmed PPB's ability to identify all um, force events that occurred. Um, when we were asking for a reliable count of force by day, um, we, we were told that we, they would not be able to provide that. Um, we were informed that they had some difficulty in locating and tracking all the FDCRs and after actions, particularly in the first week or, or two. Um, had issues with timely after actions. Um, and we were also able to identify videos um, that PPB had not sought out. Um, and, and that really spoke to the management of the, of the force of being able to identify all uses of force events. Uh, that's not to say that PPB didn't take any steps. Um, a lot of the steps that they did take or were reasonable and um, likely uh, can help uh, better manage force in the future. Um, but, but as Dr. Rosenbaum said, there, there was a lot of on-the-fly adjustments, and, and some of them were assigning a key case number um, so that uh, each night of uh, protests would have a specific key case number that officers could use to track. Um, however, this was not consistently applied. Um, you were able to link some. Um, so for instance, the detectives division, they used a different case number. Um, as well as the key case number, you can link the two, um, but additional steps are needed. Uh, another step that uh, PBB took was uh, assigning an after action sergeant for each squad for each night, as opposed to one sergeant reviewing all of the force reports in a single night. Um, and finally, uh, taking management steps to placing officers on administrative duty, uh, officers that had used potentially problematic uses of force, um, identifying those officers and placing them on administrative duty. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Rosenbaum for training. Mute myself. I've got to unmute myself. Sorry. Can you hear me? Anybody? Yes. 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 Hear okay, you. great. Um, so um, the and training, uh, as we describe in our report, um, the Portland Police Bureau training was weakened by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, by the long-term protests against racial injustice, and by some administrative decision-making within the Bureau and the city. Um, these factors resulted in changes to the training schedule and the content and the methods of delivery and the evaluation metrics. Uh, however, you know, most of these training systems have continued to function and meet the sort of minimum standards for this settlement agreement, but uh, some did not. And we can, we can this uh, slide here is really says to you that we continue to apply the same evaluation standards uh, that we've had in the past. Uh, and uh, this is required by the settlement agreement, they must do a needs assessment. Uh, that's still in progress, uh, and it'll probably have less impact on the training plan for 2021, uh, because training for 2021 is heavily shaped by the need for makeup classes, which I'll talk about in a minute, not new classes that might be suggested if new training needs were identified. Uh, that's, that's a whole nother issue. But We've argued that, you know, for example, crowd management should be a priority along with communication skills for procedural justice and crisis intervention, that sort of thing. And I think that they'll, they'll do that. We've seen a preliminary plan. The evaluation systems, they're continuing those. They have some very talented people over there, but they're less extensive. Uh, some of the metrics were lost when they did a quick conversion to online training in the middle of the year. Um, this, the, uh, Portland Police Bureau hopes to recover some of that in 2021, uh, but it's not a compliance issue for us because they, uh, we think that they're going to uh, get that in order and they also have a pretty good system in place now. I'll come back to that though, what I think needs to be done. 
In terms of analysis and reporting of forest data, uh, PPB continues, um, the forest inspector continues to look at that data and the team there analyzes it and they have given a presentation to the Training Advisory Council uh, or TAC in July. Uh, PPB continues to document and report training, um, the documenting and reporting of it. That has continued through their uh, learning management system or LMS. Uh, and, um, and now in terms of delivering high quality training, let's move on to the next slide because this is where we have uh, encountered some problems. Um, the in-service training, which is really the main backbone for most officers to get refresher training each year, was discontinued in March uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, and at that point, I think about 55% of the officers had not received the skills refresher training. Um, it's kind of a two-part thing. You get the classroom and then you get the hands-on skills training. Uh, that included use of force and de-escalation and procedural justice, you know, skills that we consider essential for the proper management of crowds and also and protests as well as daily operations in the field. Um, the Bureau did not propose a makeup plan until late August. Uh, they did plan to restart some smaller classes uh, during the summer to meet the requirement uh, on social distancing set up by the governor, but that was quickly discarded when the protest started. In fact, uh, the police bureau pretty much emptied out the training academy and put nearly everyone on the front lines of the protests. Uh, and so in a nutshell, the required 2020 in-service training uh, will not be delivered to the majority of the police force in 2020, but in 2021. Uh, you know, I credit them. They introduced some online videos to cover the classroom portion of, for the officers, but 55% were left without the skills portion of in-service, including 485 officers who didn't get their state required eight hours of training in use of force. Um, so Tom, let's go on to the next slide on remedial action that, that we feel is needed. Um, you know, I think, so the, the Bureau needs to provide more details in a training plan to ensure that the, the skills classes that were missed in 2020 are included in the 2021 in-service training. Um, you know, here we need to know that the, the Bureau is committed to restoring the original in-service training that we observed and that we approved uh, way back in February and March. Uh, so I, they do have the ability to do this. There's no question about that. Um, you know, we need to know that all officers will receive refresher training, not only in use of force, but the escalation, procedural justice, and crowd management. You know, these makeup plans, there is a makeup plan that they put together. It was a good start, but it just lacks some of these details. And more specifically, you know, details about the methods of training as well, and not just the classes that are gonna be offered and how they'll be integrated and evaluated. You know, we wanna see lesson plans and know that meaningful scenarios will be introduced that are helpful for acquiring particular communication skills. We wanna know how many hours will be devoted to each session and how officers will be evaluated in debriefing sessions. So uh, Portland Police Bureau is trying to catch up what they couldn't do, could felt they couldn't do in 2020 and loaded into the 2021 in-service training that starts in January, I believe. Um, so um, I guess I also here's point out that there is a significant time gap between the officers getting their classroom presentation of the material in the first half of 2020 and then receiving the skills training on these topics in the first half of 2021. So roughly a year later. So I think PPB needs to give some type of brief refresher on the knowledge component before they jump into the skills component. But I don't want to bore you with it down in the weeds here. So, uh, but we have specific recommendations there. Tom, if we can go on to the training challenges that remain. Uh, I just described the first one here, figuring out how to link knowledge, which comes through these classroom videos and lectures to practice, which is in-person skills training. Um, 
something you know needs to be done to link the two given the time gap that exists. And then expanding the virtual training from videos to interactive adult learning. Um, the videos they used were a good start. They were just videos of the training that occurred in January and February, but uh, the Bureau must catch up you know, with what we see going on nationwide. High schools and colleges around the country now uh, in this COVID-19 world, they're all providing real interactive learning using platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams like we're doing tonight. Uh, and so this is a big challenge that, that requires a lot of time and IT resources. And, you know, but I just, my argument is that just uh, watching videos isn't adequate and they need to create interactions between students and instructors, which is really essential for acquiring and retaining certain types of knowledge and skill sets uh, based on my experience. Um, and then introducing surveys and tests to evaluate the virtual training. You know, they, PPB has some really good surveys that we even help them refine them and develop them early on. And these metrics need to be adapted to the virtual world so that, so that the Bureau can immediately provide feedback on some virtual, you know, why some of the virtual instructors are doing really well and why others are not. And that type of evaluation system they had in the past prior to, to 2020, I hope they can do that. But as my last point here indicates, locating the funding necessary to achieve these goals is difficult. This is the biggest challenge, especially in light of the budget cuts that are related to the virus and cuts related to the protests and the defund police movement. Um, you know, the police division should not be funded so heavily, in my opinion, by overtime budget, uh, which has been cut and, uh, and they're experiencing more cuts. Uh, and if they do, um, I, I think the important thing is they have to have a workforce that's properly trained for a very difficult job. And I think it should be a priority. Dennis, um, I don't want to cut yeah. you off, but I'm just aware of the time. So hopefully sure. we could get to the comment, public comment at some point soon. Sure. Um, this is a two hour meeting, right? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll speed it up a bit. You know, I don't want to get in the middle of this um, heated debate about defunding the police. We certainly support re-envisioning the police function and exploring alternative ways to deliver certain services that are currently handled by the police. But in our report, we also point out that uh, PPB already has one of the smallest budgets in the country relative to the other 50, 49 largest cities. They have the second smallest budget when you look at the, um, and, and the officer to population ratio doesn't show that Portland's over police. They only rank 329th uh, out of 634 cities. Um, we, I, we do point out that the paragraph seven requires the city to fund the police adequately to achieve compliance. Um, the COCAL, um, we just want training to be a priority. Okay, uh, Tom, I think, are you up next? Yes. Or is that me? No, that's me. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, for some of these, uh, some of these sections, I think we can go through them uh, fairly quickly because we've seen the maintenance of compliance um, similar to to prior quarters. Uh, so, for instance, with Section Five community-based mental health services, uh, we we continue to find that the city and PPB play an active role um, in community-based mental health services, uh, as evidenced by the BHUAC, uh, uh, which is the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee. Um, the Behavioral Health Coordination Team, uh, the Unity Transportation Work Group, Oregon Behavioral Health Collaborative, and the Legacy ED Community Outreach Group. Uh, additionally, we, we continue to find that the Unity Center operates in accordance with the Memphis model of a crisis response system, um, and it mitigates the potential for criminalization as well as reduces resource burden on PPB. Uh, with crisis intervention, um, we, with uh, BOAC, uh, the Bureau of uh, Emergency Communications, uh, the, the policies continue to remain in effect of when to dispatch an ECIT officer. Uh, BOAC continues to provide a 16 hour CIT training for all new uh, employees and telecommunicators, uh, as well as uh, in the past, they had provided uh, in-service training. Obviously this year, COVID has impacted this as well as the protests. 
Uh, they, they've conducted alternate training approaches um, and, and we've been uh, in communication with them about when, when in-service might start up again, um, but, but they've obviously been uh, impacted by, by the pandemic and the protests. Um, with PPB, all officers continue to receive 40 hours of CIT prior to graduating the Advanced Academy. Uh, this year, uh, classes were conducted via Zoom uh, for the classroom portion, as well as in-person scenarios and debriefings. Um, the, the annual in-service, as, as uh, Dr. Rosenbaum alluded to, has been impacted uh, by COVID and the protests. Um, however, uh, one of the things that we've recently learned is PPB is putting together a in-service um, training for all officers that will, uh, that will relate to crisis intervention. Um, additionally, uh, PPB has recently put on a supervisor's academy. Uh, this was, I went to the third week of it last week in Portland, uh, and it contained an ECIT as a street level resource for supervisors class, um, which was uh, well done and it reinforced the importance of, a, of ECIT as an important resource. Um, <clears throat> ECIT officers, um, they can they receive 40 additional hours on top of the 40 hours that all officers receive. Uh, PPB, the last class that they put forth was in November, uh, and, and a, a new ECIT class. Um, consistent with the settlement agreement, they retain their normal patrol duties, um, and there's a certain selection and retention criteria for being an ECIT officer. Uh, PPB has continued with their mental health template, which is a data collection tool and allows PPB to evaluate the ECIT program uh, through a quarterly evaluation um, of, of some metrics, as well as a uh, more comprehensive semi-annual evaluation. Uh, we've also uh, noted some qualitative outcomes. Um, I, I think a lot of uh, Portland community members are are familiar with the officer involved shooting involving uh, an individual in crisis holding two knives. Um, one of the things that I'm not sure that all Portland community members are aware of are between April 15th and May 7th, there were three interactions, um, very similar situations with persons holding knives. All of them were de-escalated with, without uh, the use of lethal force. Um, so again, just as something, and this is something that PPB has put they're, they're required to highlight the successes of ECIT, and at least one of these interactions was in uh, their their uh, quarterly um, re newsletter. Tom, I'm just going to interrupt here. I want to know how much more time because community members are asking, and it's we're 45 minutes in. Um, and so, I think, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. I really appreciate them giving the information. So. It, what was this, what's on the agenda? This is on the agenda, but community people want to be have time to ask questions. So I'm just trying to get a sense of how much longer the presentation will go. I just, I just wanted to mention that uh, while there are community members that have read through the entirety of the document, there are members of the community on this call that have not read through the entirety of this document. So we have to be inclusive of, of all folks uh, in, in this meeting. There will be over an hour, I assume, uh, of, of time for community and PSEP comment. Um, but, but I think it, it is important that we uh, we allow uh, Coco to respectfully to, to get through this. Tom, do you, I think we should be able to finish this up in the next 10 or 15 minutes at most, right? I, I believe so, yes sir. Yeah. Okay, um, great. Um, so also a part of the crisis intervention section is the behavioral health response team. Uh, there's five teams within Portland. Uh, each precinct has a team as well as uh, a team for the houseless population and a team with follow-up for BHRT clients. Um, acceptance rates continue to be approximately 50%, um, 45 and 55%. Uh, but again, just maintaining the compliance that they had, uh, that we had found them in um, for the past you know, couple of years. Uh, same thing with the service coordination team. Um, which uh, facilitates the provision of services to persons who are chronically houseless, suffer chronic addiction, and are chronically involved with the criminal justice system. Uh, we've seen, uh, we've 
uh, conducted analysis showing uh, positive impact on employment and police contacts. Um, there's a Portland State University annual capstone st study class that has found lower costs to the county. Um, we're still waiting for the for the most recent uh, report. Um, but we, we anticipate it will likely uh, be positive as well. Uh, the number of SCT inv individuals that were referred for this last quarter shows a bit low. However, again, that's related to COVID. Um, finally, as it relates to the crisis intervention section, we look at the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee, um, which is an advisory body to PPB about mental health response. Uh, they they went through a number of topics in the in the second quarter. Um, we we list all of these in our report. Um, but one of the things that we we feel is a positive uh, step is that members continue to participate in the PSEPs behavioral health subcommittee meetings. Um, the employee information system again we we find that they maintain compliance. Um, with with uploading data, with uh, with alerts when somebody uh, triggers one of the thresholds that's listed in the settlement agreement as requiring a EIS uh, alert, um, and getting the right alerts to supervisors. Um, I'll just go through this real quick. Uh, the interventions, um, and so an intervention might be a discussion with the officer. It might be a referral to training. It might be a uh, you know, 30, 60 day monitoring. Um, but what we've seen is that the interventions for this second quarter was about 90% of the alerts that were sent to the supervisor, 90% received some type of intervention. So obviously the supervisors are feeling that there's something there and they're, they're conducting the interventions with the officers. Um, EIS also requires a uh, review of an officer's uh, EIS history. What we saw in this quarter was a sharp decline in the uh, new to command reviews. Um, PPB had also identified this trend before we had identified the trend though. Um, and they had sent a bureau wide memo out to all PPB uh, members to say, if you are changing uh, your position or if you are receiving somebody, if somebody new is coming under your command, you have to do these reviews to all the subordinates. Um, so while we do see a decline here, we did see that uh, PPB self-identified and self-initiated a, uh, a remedial action. And so we'll look to see um, whether that, that corrects itself in the future. Um, this was the section that I really want to take a little bit of time on uh, the accountability. The protests, uh, events doubled the number of contacts and complaints that came into IPR. Um, so in June and July, out of 336 total contacts, 165 related to the protests. That's 49.1%. Again, with it, had these protests not occurred, uh, IPR's, uh, IPR's contacts and complaints would, would not have uh, increased the way that they did. And it's an important uh, point that I want to get to. So for instance, in June, 77 administrative investigations were opened. The average since May of 2019 was 35.6 per month. So again, this doubling of work. Two IPR investigators are currently handling the same volume of administrative investigations as the entire IPR handled one year ago. So all of this is under access. Uh, we, we found that uh, PPB and IPR have maintained their access uh, to be able to file a complaint, and obviously because people have been. Um, but it's because of this volume, it's because of the number of contacts and complaints that have come in um, that this has Im impacted expediency. Uh, being able to deal with stages of investigations um, in, in a timely manner. So IPR has decreased in their ability to meet stage timelines, particularly with intake investigations. Um, and this, this chart shows you, these are for all stages. The blue line is for IA um, within PPB and the orange line is for IPR. So we've seen in June and July, the number of, of cases that met their stage timelines uh, has decreased. There's a couple of reasons for this though. 
Um, first of all, complainants are not always engaging with IPR. So when IPR is trying to I, you know, conduct the intake investigation um, and make an informed decision as to whether to put it forth for a full administrative investigation, they need to be able to talk with complainants. When they're not able to talk with them, it takes the time to then, to then identify other ways to engage with them or, or to make the decision. Um, ad additionally, officer identity is not always known. If you get an incident where you have a number of officers using less lethal uh, weapons and uh, a community member complains that they were uh, hit with one of those less lethal weapons, IPR has to be able to identify those officers. Um, but in a, in a large group of officers, it's not always the easiest uh, to identify which specific officer hit them with the less lethal. Um, and, and finally, just this just the sheer volume uh, has impacted their ability to expediently uh, resolve these, uh, these cases. Um, IPR has taken a number of steps to increase their expediency, including uh, meetings to allow for PPB officers to self-identify, um, keeping the person of the day the same to, to uh, keep everything consistent, uh, having a single point of contact for document requests, referring cases to IA, um, and enhancing their case management. However, one of the things that, that we've been informed is at, at some point they, they'll reach, a, if they haven't already, they have, uh, will reach a, a point of saturation where all of these efforts will, there won't be any increased, uh, increased uh, efficiency. Um, our total evaluation will depend on the 180 day assessment though, uh, because that's what paragraph 121 says is that the complete case will be completed in 180 days. Um, we still find that the accountability system is largely transparent. You can track your cases. Um, that's, that's largely consistent uh, between IA and IPR. We just observed a joint training between IA and IPR, a refresher training. Um, and that the system of checks and balances that are found within the accountability system remain. Um, and finally, there was uh, accountability section has, has a section about OIS events, officer involved shooting events. Um, there was one in the second quarter, all of the things that would be required uh, under an OIS were followed, separation of witness involved officers, walkthrough CROs, um, and all, all of the things that are in the settlement agreement. Um, finally, we, we, we make one comment about the ballot measure that will be upcoming in November. Uh, and so long as the final construction of the proposed board is in line with the settlement agreement, um, we, we take no position on it. However, paragraph four does say that the, the, any new board um, would still have to comply with the settlement agreement. Um, and then Dennis, I'll, I'll hand it over to you for community engagement. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, this is section nine. I'm going to wrap this up before the top of the hour. That's my goal. Um, community engagement and the PSEP role. Uh, the good news is I don't have to tell you what you folks are already doing, but you've continued to support, you know, multiple subcommittees and seeking input from the community and government. You continue to meet monthly. Uh, you continue to host listening sessions. You can you've continued to pass multiple recommendations. Uh, I've heard, though, that some of the recommendations, uh, there's concern about the timeliness of feedback from the city, so we can talk about that uh, if you want to bring that up later. I, I don't want to, I could respond to it, but I don't want to take the time right now. I think that's an issue. Uh, in general, though, our impression is that the PSEP has a good working relationship with the police bureau and the mayor's office, and, and the city continues to do its job to, in terms of uh, supporting the PSEP with membership and training and staffing and uh, technical assistance with meetings. So in some, I think that I uh, feel strongly that the PSEP continues to function as a legitimate body for community engagement with city support. So if we can go on to the next slide, Tom, in terms of P PPB's role, there's no question that they've uh, continued to engage community uh, in different strategies. Uh, it's been altered because of the pandemic and the protests, but uh, especially their community engagement division has continued to very creatively engage different communities throughout the city uh, and uh, moving to a virtual platform. They've established these partnerships with organizations from very diverse parts of Portland and shared information about the, uh, the Bureau and its performance statistics. Uh, it's maintained and supported relationships with a half a dozen advisory councils. They're all on the website, including PSIP and the training advisory council. 
Um, the Bureau has been fully transparent in the provision of quarterly and annual reports on traffic stops and use of force with breakdowns by race and gender and, and made that data available to TAC as well for reanalysis. Um, and as we've described in the report, they've made significant progress toward implementing the four key components of the community engagement plan. Um, and so we find uh, them, uh, the city and PPB and has maintained compliance with section nine on community engagement. Now the challenge is ahead, Tom, if you can move to the next slide. You know, at this moment in history, let's not be naive that the relationships are strained by the protests. Uh, clearly, there have been challenges on both sides of the fence when it comes to building trust. You know, inside the bureau, officers are exhausted physically and mentally and demoralized by protests directed at them. And outside, the protesters have expressed their anger and distrust of the police and frustration with city government. And, and uh, you know, can, uh, my point is consistent community oriented leadership in the bureau as well is needed to build strong and lasting partnerships yet PPB has experienced six police chiefs over the last six years. And, uh, and I hope the city helps to stabilize that in the future. So despite these constraints though, I, you know, I have to say I'm impressed with the many partnerships and advisory councils that have been created over the last few years and the willingness of these community members to volunteer their time and be part of this reform movement, even in the face of uncertainty, you know, about where this is all gonna end up and, and how we're gonna get there. So. Thank you. I'm going to stop there and we'll open it up when uh, for questions and comments. Thank you. Um, Tom, if you could stop sharing the screen and get back to everyone. Okay, so um, we are almost at the top of the hour, but I will just open it up and then pass it on to um, Lakiana. Um, we thought since uh, the public really this is a town hall for the public that we would give the public first an opportunity to ask questions and then we would um, take piece up comment after that so if you could use your raise hand function i see vadim there but we will start with um susan hello my name is susan cotter um uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, I use she, her pronouns, and I live as opposed to you in Portland. Uh, you place a lot of emphasis on the budget compared to other cities, but we all know that there are significant nuances in the budget, and only 10% of our budget is actually discretionary budget, which is what where the police funding goes to. So we have 35% of our discretionary budget spent on PPB and the non-discretionary budget has a lot to do with capital budget, capital expenditures and lots of other things. So it sounds like what you're doing is comparing us to other cities that don't have similar budget structures. And I had sent this note ahead of time asking, and I, I really feel like the statistic that you used is um, deceptive because of that. And I, my, note to you ahead of time to give you a chance to respond um, uh, thoughtfully is what valid budget statistic can we use to compare with similar cities? Well, thank you, Susan. First of all, does my um, mute off? I guess it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, First of all, it's not my statistics. Uh, I, and I think you know it's important to point out this was done by the 24-7 uh, Wall Street researchers at USA Today. Oh, I meant in your report, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I, in the report where I refer to the fact that the Chicago Portland uh, budget is only 4.4% uh, of the total budget, uh, that's the operating budget. I'm using their statistics where they standardize the comparison across these 50 large cities. So the reality is that Portland ranks 49th out of 50 when you compare their budget to the total. And, and if you're coming up with some other concept of discretionary money, I would prefer that that be explained. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm confident that these folks used uh, pretty common standards across the different 50 so tell me again who these folks are. Uh, well, it's in the article is in there. I actually provided the link to the article. 
Yeah, in, if you don't mind just repeating the reason, yeah. the scores. So they're, uh, it's a group, and uh, uh, they call themselves the 24 7 Wall Street group, and they, they work, they, their report was appeared in USA Today. And uh, they, they list every single city uh, and the details of the data that they have. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to, we could have a long debate. We don't have a lot of time tonight about budgets. I mean, you're arguing that uh, Portland Police Bureau takes up 35% of some discretionary budget. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know how that compares with other cities. I don't know what that means. I'm just saying when you use standard metrics across cities, they rank very low in terms of how much of the city budget they use up. Well, and I doubt that you're, I doubt your statistic. I mean, because not I my feel, statistic. Be clear. It it's is not your my statistic. statistic. It's your statistic okay. that you are quoting. Okay. okay, Susan, I think um, there's a, there are different ways to look at statistics. Um, I think the report represents one statistic. I, I've seen, as Susan mentioned, there's other ways to look at it. I don't know how that also compares across cities. So that's something um, hopefully we could look at. Um, next up is Portland Cop Watch. Oh, hi, uh, Dan Handelman with Portland Cop Watch. I, I use he, him pronouns. And uh, I, I wanna start out by thanking this compliance team for calling out the city uh, and the bureau for missing their compliance in um, those two areas that you have identified already, and probably they will be out of compliance with accountability as well. And especially for calling out that one incident where the officer clearly in the video deliberately walks up to a woman and hits her in the head with a baton, uh, and that the IPR called that a push, and that the Bureau called it an accident is you know, an, an outrage after all these years that we've been trying to have reform and transparency and openness about what's going on, it's just an outrage that those those uh, terms are being used by the agencies that are supposed to be holding these officers accountable. So I appreciate that you did that and that you continue to talk about the importance of the social justice movement that is uh, present here and around the country. Um, that said, uh, I continue to be concerned about kind of the dividing line that you just described in words tonight about you know, talking about mostly property damage being done by community members, whereas the police are actually beating people on the head and uh, using less lethal weapons, so-called, against them, and uh, using chemical agents, whether or not it's tear gas, um, that is violence, okay? There, it's debatable whether or not when you harm a piece of, an, an inanimate object, if that's violence or not, and I, I, I say it's not. Um, so uh, that article about the, the focus on the budget that Ms. Cotter brought up, it is, that same article says that we spend the, the 31st most out of the top 50 cities just in raw numbers of how much money we spend. So the fact that you've latched on to this second, you know, second least percentage of our overall budget, some cities include their school, uh, school districts in their city budgets, and we don't. So it's just it, there, there are very many different factors. And as a social scientist and somebody who does statistics, you should have looked into that more and maybe done a per capita expense or something to see how where we rate on that. Right now, we're in a debate where the community is demanding that the police cut more of their funds. And there are several places in this report where you ask for more money to be spent on the police. And when you're talking about the overload of the IPR, you do not suggest that we take some of the, uh, the investigator money that's going to the internal affairs and give it to IPR instead. So instead, instead of suggesting such a thing, you know, the IPR turned over one quarter of the use of force cases at the protest for internal affairs to investigate. And that's why the public wants to have an independent police oversight system so that the police aren't investigating other police. And it's exactly why there's a ballot measure about that right now, um, because people do not want to see that continue. Um, and, I, I, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff that I want to uh, call talk about, but I, I guess I'll try to um, quickly just say that uh, oh, um, it's, uh, you know, you, you raised the, the question about whether or not it was appropriate for them to take the officers out of the training division and send them out to the front lines, quote unquote, of the protest. Uh, and you said, of course, you need officers on the front line. But the deployment question is part of the overall question about everything that you've raised. If the Portland police did not send so many officers out and those officers did not engage in so much violence, 
they wouldn't have such a backlog of cases that they had to report on. The supervisor wouldn't have that many cases that they had to review for the after action reports. And there'd be plenty of officers in the training division to keep training the other officers what they're doing. So this is all political decisions that were made by either the police themselves or by the political leadership to send officers out onto the streets and use this violence against protesters to try to stop the movement from doing what it's doing. Uh, and so I, I think you really have to really examine that, and especially, again, as a social scientist who's looking at what is causing these backlogs, these are decisions that they're making that aren't necessarily appropriate. Um, so if there's more time later, I'll try to raise my hand again, but thank you. Uh, you want me to quickly respond to that? Yes, Elliot? please. Uh, well, thank you, Dan. You always bring up a number of good points. Uh, on your last point there about taking people out of the training cab, we described that factually. I tried not to uh, take too strong of a stand. I certainly did not say it was a good decision. Uh, and I implied that there were problems. That was a management decision. Uh, you, you didn't have to take everybody. You could have taken a good chunk of people without uh, doing that. And um, and I think that it's very possible that you can, the, the, the strategy of how do you respond to protests, uh, it, you know, it's very possible that showing less force and less numbers uh, would have had fewer problems. Uh, so I'm not going to challenge you on that. Um, I don't want to relive this budget thing again, except to say that I have some faith that these researchers controlled for whether the schools were part of your budget and all of that. I mean, we can check that more. I don't wanna rely on that, but they, they did uh, provide other statistics. For example, uh, how the, the number of law enforcement employees per 100,000 of the population. So at least there's some standardized data there. Portland ranks 180, has 180 uh, per 100,000, which ranks them 329th. Uh, out of 634. So they're not like over, there's not a million police there per population in Portland. So not saying that that that, that you can't rethink the budget. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm just saying our job was to say, uh, I don't think that the training was, you know, had enough people and their IT program needs to be beefed up as well. But anyway. Okay, uh, thanks. Back to, is there other questions? He brought up a num number. Thank you for, we did acknowledge, we, we we did call it out what we saw and uh, the uh, and I hear what you're saying about the police response as well and maybe uh, there there's violence uh, on both sides we did call that out in that that one example that we did not feel was unintentional as the officer said it was thanks Dennis I'm going to pass it over to Lakiana now um, to continue the facilitation thanks Elliot. Um, Dr. Rosenbaum, were you done with that point that you're making? Yeah, no, go ahead. That's fine. Okay, great. Yeah, so let's continue on with uh, community um, member comments. If you can just raise your hands in the chat box uh, or in the uh, participant box, and we will call on you. I think Zainab has been there. Oh, my bad. I'm, I'm scrolled way down at the bottom. Yeah, go ahead, Zainab. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate you being able to share the report too. I wasn't able to read the entire report yet. I was um, actually um, on who, which page on the, I was trying to wonder why it skipped from, it said section three. So what happened section one and two? That's what I was looking for. Um, and perhaps I just missed how it was um, um, printed. Um, I I I was thinking the same comments that Susan and and, and Cop Watch um, was is talking about when it comes to the budget, and then the number of cops you had a 485 who did not receive training out of how many, um, and so I, that was like if yeah. I on like how many if that's like 100 percent of them or if that was a percent. Yeah. And I know you said 55%, but so is that 55% of the 485? Did that number go with the, that number? Yeah, I it's, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, there's over 900 officers, I think. I don't have the exact number. Uh, uh, 922 is the number I have in front of me, but that there may be people that are missing from that. So it's over half the police force, yeah. And uh, go ahead, I don't want to interrupt you. 
And so, and I, and I, and I got the question about the, but that's the first thing I thought about was, you know, when you're not given the right tools um, and resources and funding is one of those things. And I'm not going into a debate about defunding or, you know, police or not. What I'm really saying about when you're getting training and that they put people out there without the proper training, even the basic training. And so with your report that you provided, and this again, this is my, this is your third report. So I didn't see the other two reports. Was it consistent with what you have seen in other reports? Um, and I'm asking that to other people who have been here um, <laughs> with PSAP, if this is the same information that you received or is, is different. Same information in terms of what, like the same style report or like- No, no, no. In regards to if, like you notice how you talked about that they didn't get trained. So were they not training the other, like the other two reports that you you, you provided, were they training their, their staff then? Like was there yes. people trained? Yes, yeah. I, can, I can respond to that. Yes, the, this is the first year. And the debate is about whether there was any, you know, some people argue that there's absolutely nothing they could have done. And uh, this is the first year because of the pandemic and the protests, and it's all like a perfect storm. Uh, that, but um, we we chose to argue that there were things that could have been done, and uh, but 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 that we we do acknowledge and admit that we think uh, that the more we looked at it, that their uh, the training division is not adequately funded. It's something we didn't really look at before much because we didn't, they were able to get most of it done, but uh, they've gradually lost position. So I'm not saying where the money should come from or whether it should come from another division or the city should provide it. Uh, and I'm not saying uh, it's possible that they could put together a compliance plan without the extra money for training. Uh, mm -hmm. They won't necessarily do state-of-the-art stuff with IT virtual stuff because that is going to require more work. But but anyway, you know, I just we're just pointing out that it didn't happen. The training looks like money is is one of the factors. They they used a lot of their overtime money to fill in positions to have instructors come off the street and then they have to hire officers to fill those in. Um, you and know, then in regards to your cockle, and I'm not sure what piece that. In regards to the COCL, and are you, is someone there to assess it personally, or are you just going by reports? No, we've been there ourselves, and I, we, were, we, we were there quite a bit earlier in the year, and then Tom was just recently out there. Uh, we also have uh, people on the ground in Portland, one person that lives there. Uh, right. So, That's cool. yeah. So Thank can you. I clarify one thing? Um, I, I just want to say that the officers have received training on crowd control. They have received training on use of force. Uh, the, the training that was missed this year was refresher training, uh, particularly with their crowd control training. This was an important refresher training um, that, that wasn't delivered. Uh, but but it's, not, it, it's not like that PPB officers have never received training on these things before. Um, this was just the annual refresher training as required by the settlement agreement. And if you're new, how many of those of those officers were new? That's the question. Well, the new officers did get their training. That's a special uh, academy for them, and it, it's taken a while, but they've gotten a, quite. A, most of them have been trained. All right. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. So next up, we have um, Barb. Then we're going to go back to Debbie, and then or to Debbie, and then uh, back to Susan. Barb, um, do you want me to read your question, or do you want to do you want to give it yourself? Sorry, I didn't have my tech support ready because I wasn't ready to go. Um, that's okay. That's okay. But what I put in the chat was more or less directed at Mary Claire or anybody that knows. This is the first of a couple questions. What is the cop population for Portland PBB right now, given the 
who are who are like I'm going to say fully trained as in trained. maybe not refresher trained, but not the new recruits. Um, based on losing a bunch of people in August. Mary Claire, are you able to speak to that? <clears throat> or anybody else from PPB that's on? Oh, terrible support. No, here she is. Oh, oh <laughs> sorry. I just had to find the mute button. Sorry. Yeah, it's the hardest part. I hear that. Go ahead, Mary Claire. Um, I am sorry, uh, I do not have the number off the top of my head, but I can certainly get it for you. I would really appreciate that. I think it would help us have a clearer picture of what what's, what they're dealing with and what's going on. Um, I heard that, that from the chief that the number was something around 50 officers that retired in August. Yes. Yes, I know it was a, I know, yeah. Uh, yeah. right. I'm I'm with you on that, and then there were supposedly some Five res years. resignations also. But I also saw somebody put a link to something in the chat, so I will check that out. Um, I'm wondering if the city or the police department or IPR, whoever would have been in charge of checking with the DOJ or the COCOL, etc., about the decision to skip June. Was that, I mean, did they did they reach out or was that just like a unilateral thing? And then, yeah, I'm not gonna ask. The other one is sort of like, how do you see stuff in the next like two or three years? But I, I don't think that that one's fair. I think that's a good question to throw in there. I think I think the, they can take a stab at okay. that. And um, um, also the other, let's start with the other one that you had though around um, the decision to skip June. And just for my recollection, can you, because I saw it in the report, uh, what did they skip in June again? Uh, they skipped yes. the audit of the uh, of protest force events, um, and so you know I, I, you've been you know with us for a while on this, Lakiana. Uh, so the the audit has phase one and phase two. Um, the phase two is the force inspector uh, reviewing like the, the yeah. use of force cases to identify. Uh, potential training implications, policy implications, personnel, equipment, um, and so those are those are the cases that for the month of June uh, they were going to be skipping. And the reason uh, provided um, was so that to be able to uh, Does that count more or less comfortable with the, out the question. Amy, you're on your know. your phone. Your speaker is not off. If you can mute it, please. Thank you. Um, but the, the the reason provided to us was in order to be able to have quarter three um, completely done uh, was to to skip June um, and as they catch up as they're able to uh, you know get back on track with quarter three um, and get back on track with quarter four being able to make up that that June those June cases as well. Um, but as we said in our report, the concern with that is then the force inspector being able to identify timely trends uh, that could be provided to the policy division or the training division. Um, and, and so that was our concern with that. Um, but the rationale was to be able to then grab quarter three and grab quarter four and be able to fully do those quarters. But Rather that was than, not my question. My sure. question was, did did they consult outside before they made that decision? I think Mary Claire was going to. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Yes, um, I did speak to both COCOL and DOJ when uh, before making that decision. Um, you should understand, number one, it's not an audit of the thing. It's a count. Uh, the audit for crowd control is only done once a year, as Tom mentioned earlier. Uh, and I think it's also important to note that we were late only on the crowd control um, pieces of force. The regular force, the day-to-day, -day, so to speak, force uh, reporting was done in timely fashion and was included in the second quarter report as required. The only piece of this was when uh, in counting the uses of force um, for the month of June because you know, there was so 
much activity at, you know, when this first began the end of May, the beginning of June. So um, we uh, knew that we would be out of compliance for that piece or could be charged with being out of uh, compliance for that piece. So I made the decision rather than continuing that and being late on the third quarter and then the fourth quarter because it would snowball to uh, stop the count of June and get current with the uh, third quarter, which is uh, July, August, and September, so that the November report will have um, all the information that's uh, required for the settlement agreement in terms of the uses of force. Mary Claire, thank you very much for saying all of that. I'm not sure that if you read the chat or I would have put it in there for you, but thank you, thank you. You're welcome. And then I had another question though, right? Yep, go ahead, uh, Barb. Oh, it was where do you, where do you see yourselves? What role do you see yourselves playing a year from now, two years from now, et cetera? Um, are you talking to the COCO or? I am. Yeah. Well, I don't want to even think that far ahead. I mean, I frankly, you know, I was hoping this would be over, uh, but it's not. And I do care about Portland. Um, but we're going to have to wait for DOJ to, uh, they're the leader in this thing, and uh, they have to decide uh, where Portland is out of compliance or if they're not at all. They may feel that somehow in this last quarter, and I know Portland's trying to, to do that, that they've managed to fill these gaps uh, and come up with good plans for filling them. And they may decide that while we respect COCA, we don't agree with them and we think that they're in full compliance and this thing's over. Uh, it would be over January 10th or something. So if not, it could drag out next year and um, these areas that we have concern and training and accountability and uh, um, what's the other one, Tom? I'm blanking on it. Um, uh, use of force. Use of force, excuse me. It's late here in Chicago. <laughs> um, but uh, so I really can't, uh, Barb, uh, answer your question fully. We, we're always available to help. I mean, we've given a lot of technical assistance over the last five years, and Portland's been pretty open to that. And uh, again, I don't feel it's a, I, you know, I have certain petty things that drive me nuts, like body-worn cameras. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, we'll, we'll be helpful if we can, but um, we, we're not we're, we're not scheduled to do anything next year if this, unless this uh, is extended, so. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna keep things rolling. Just to let folks know, we really wanna prioritize the community, knowing that PSET members do have access to COCO offline and at other times. So we'll go to probably around 7.45 uh, for community questions, and then leave just some space to end for a couple of PSET questions. But, uh, next up on the queue, we have Debbie, then we'll go to Suzanne, or Susan, excuse me, and then um, back to Dan with Portland Cop Watch. Hi, ahead, this Debbie. is uh, Debbie Iona. Um, uh, first, I want to say how much I appreciated that we did get the presentation tonight. I find those very helpful. And then wondered, uh, uh, my question for Dr. Rosenbaum is if he's had a chance to look at the OIR group's latest report. And if he has any comments on the length of time those investigations took that were captured in that report, and to what extent does he end up using the information in those reports in these um, quarterly um, reports? Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Debbie. I, I have not, I've been pretty stressed out lately with a lot of work. I have not looked at the latest report other than to read the summary. Uh, we have incorporated their work in the past and used it, and we think I, I think they do good work, um, and I don't have a problem with it. And uh, Tom, I don't know if you've had a chance to. Yeah, I've, I've had a chance to review it um, uh, through throughout the entire report. Uh, 
uh, again, the OIR group is, they're an independent group. Um, they, they conduct their own, they, they do a, a very thorough job of, of diving deep into uh, officer involved shooting events and lethal force events. Um, their task though is, is somewhat different from our task. Uh, they are very broad in their approach um, by design. Our task is constricted by what the settlement agreement asks us to assess. Um, so while we do read them, um, and you know we we learn from them, and, and we you know we envelop them into our understanding of of Portland. Uh, again, it, it has to be remembered that their task is is much broader um, with respect to OIS events and officer and and lethal force events um, than the task that's required by us of the settlement agreement. Well, and I guess the thing that I found most notable related to your work was the length of time the investigations took to complete. I mean, they were way beyond, some of them were way beyond 180 days. And I'm curious if you have any comments about that. I mean, they said a lot of it just had to do with stuff sitting on people's desk for, you know, a couple months without any action being taken. Sure. And and one of the things uh, I'd, I'd have to go back to their report and see where they are calling the end point, whether they're including the grand jury. Um, I, 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 I don't remember uh, you know, looking at that uh, particularly, but one of the things that we do with uh, the accountability system and the, the 180 day timeline is, is we look at the, the overall trends. Um, and we, we do understand, and we, we've said this in a number of reports, that there are particular cases that will take over 180 days. And if it's reasonable that they do, if it's a matter of, you know, like you're saying, things are sitting on people's desks, um, if that's the cause of it going over 180 days, then that's not reasonable. But we also do look at the overall trends. And one of the things that we had seen was 94%, I believe, uh, two quarters ago, 94% were completed within the 180 day timeline. Um, I believe let, I, I can't remember what it was uh, the last quarter, um, but we, we do look at those 180 day timelines from a trend perspective with the understanding that particularly with officer involved shooting and lethal force events, those taking a uh, time over 180 days that uh, those might be a bit more reasonable than, than a more common administrative investigation. And the protests have changed the whole ballgame because those are- All of these were from be before protests or the right. coronavirus and everything. I mean, cause you know, they're always kind of behind. So, right. okay, and well, thank you for your answer. Well, and to that point, uh, you know, Debbie, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Some of them were two or three years ago um, and, I, what we saw was it was approximately, um, you know, three quarters ago that we had seen the the cases much more consistently being done in 180 180 days. So you might be right in that that those are relics from prior to when they were in substantial compliance with paragraph 121. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Um, next, um, before we get to the next speaker, I'm actually going to have Jared Hager from um, the Department of Justice who wanted to just comment on a previous question in regards to um, the decision to skip uh, the June audit uh, and the Department of Justice's standpoint on it. Jared, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Lakiana. Uh, and this is in response to Barb's question about the notice and, and whether or not the Bureau I forgot if you uh, asked it in terms of uh, gave uh, told us in advance or sought our permission. Uh, we don't give permission or things like that. And I, I did want to make clear that uh, you know Mary Claire has been in, in contact with us and the compliance officer about their plans and and the shortcomings and and where they had difficulty. Uh, but I do want to underscore that uh, the department didn't agree to any amendment of the terms to you know vary reports that might have been due. Uh, we're in the middle of collecting our evidence and putting together our report. And we expect that to be done in December with probably an early January filing date. Uh, and we'll give more information on that. But I did want to make clear that we, you know, to amend the agreement takes a, you know, an act of city council and it's got to go up the chain of, of the Department of Justice. And there was no amendment with respect to 
um, the audits that might have been required by the settlement agreement uh, in June. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Um, let's go next to Susan. Hi, this is Susan Cotter again. Um, on page five of your document that you sent out, the draft document, it talks about your feeling that the processes that were in place for mental health crisis, which is your little tiny skinny spaghetti lane, um, would be appropriate to handle equity, other equity concerns throughout um, Portland. And PPB is an anti-democratic organization whose systems in no way will address inequities. And PPBs and equities to transfer the recording keeping skills, which they're already having trouble with their recording keeping skills in this little spaghetti lane of mental health crises. And you say that they can function this, you know, in another lane, and and there's no evidence that shows that. And it really what it does is it indicates that they're more box checkers rather than have are implementing any kind of real improvement. And it's really not even professionalism. And it feels like your expensive reporting, we're going through all these details, feels like moving deck chairs on the Titanic. It feels like what you're saying just doesn't meet what we're experiencing as a community. And it makes me not trust what you're saying or that you, you know, can impact any change whatsoever and that you're worth the $300,000 a year we pay for you. you. Want me to respond to that? Yeah, feel free to. I do. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, First of all, I know the money thing comes up all the time. And uh, if you do your analysis, you'll see that we uh, of the, all the active uh, consent decrees and settlement agreements around the country, we make about one fifth of the average size of other. So we're, it's not, you know, we have a lot of people doing things. Um, about value. Okay, we can talk about value. I mean, you, I hope that you've read all of our reports from 2015 on uh, so that you can see that we were very critical, but we've, uh, Portland Police Bureau has established a lot of the systems that were required of them. And uh, we are not into box checking. We've been fighting that from day one. Uh, that's why training, I. You know, they could have said we did X, Y, and Z in training. And I kept saying, no, you haven't. That's not good enough. Go back to the drawing board. We've said that in their, their evaluations of training. No, it's not good enough. We made them develop a very detailed system, for example, just to evaluate the training, a training instructor, the content of the training, the impact, the knowledge that the students had to walk away with. So, I mean, I could spend the whole night talking to you for hours. I'm sorry you don't believe in us, but. Um, we uh, now you you maybe raise you raise another question. Do we really know that all these systems that were put in place that were not just box checking? Do we know that they've made a difference? And uh, we've looked at some outcomes, um, and we've looked at force. And you know, the, um, it's very hard without doing randomized controlled trials, which I'm an enormous fan of. By the way, I'm a fellow in the Academy of Experimental Criminology, and we only promote randomized trials. We haven't done those in Portland. It's hard to definitively prove cause and effect. Uh, but I, I do believe Portland is better off than it was. Um, I think that you know a lot of this dialogue around the country now about you need a policy on this and you need a policy on that. Well, Portland's done a lot of that. Um, and uh, did it make a difference in behavior? I wish there was more metrics uh, out in the field uh, about, you know, contact surveys and things like that. We started, we did some of that stuff, but um, you know, I think the burden is on the community and on, on the police department, the bureau to continue to collect statistics. 
that don't just deal with mental health, but deal, that was our focus. I know you call it a tiny little area, but it's really important to a lot of people. Oh, um, it is important to everyone. That's the point. Susan, it's a whole big pot of spaghetti. Susan, can we allow him to finish his thoughts and then we'll, we'll Oh, come I'm back. so sorry. Please yeah, forgive me. No, that's okay. But I do think we, we're in a time where, as I said earlier, that we've neglected the disparities in treatment by race and ethnicity that have dominated policing for so long. Um, and I think that there's still room for improvement uh, there, uh, but it wasn't the central focus of this, uh, I'm sorry to say, but um, I do think there, there are many ways that, and I think the Portland Police Bureau would agree that there's, there's still a lot of room for improvement, but I don't think it's a scam. I don't think that you know, some of the words you use to describe it are accurate. So that's just my opinion. And can I can I add to this too? Um, because uh, Susan, I'm looking at you had reference our, our comments on on page five. Um, one of the things that that we really try to push with PPB um, is to become a self learning, uh, self evaluating, and self changing organization. Um, and what we've seen through the the settlement agreement uh, is are things related to that. So, for instance. Um, doing training needs assessments, evaluating the training. Uh, you know, we, we've provided a lot of technical assistance and PPB has uh, made large strides in, in evaluating uh, not, not only whether officers liked the training, but was the training effective? Is there uh, changes in knowledge? Is there training uh, changes in attitude? Uh, similarly, looking at the force audit, uh, I, I can tell you um, firsthand the ability of PPB to, to conduct trend analysis on force events has increased exponentially over the last six years. Um, their ability to provide, uh, provide evidence to policy uh, division and training division that, that things need to be changed. That was something that, that wasn't there uh, six years ago. Um, so that's where I think that we're saying that the, the lessons learned from, from the settlement agreement can be used in the future, and and, and I know that uh, you know even prior to I, I believe you you started coming to these the last quarter, um, but prior to that last quarter, we we made many references of you know we identified this issue, but so did PPB before we did, and then they made these changes consistent with the with the trends. Um, so these are things that we've seen PPB grow into is the self evaluative and, and self-changing organization. And I think that that's what we're saying is with, with what they've done as relates to the settlement agreement can be expanded out further um, into larger systems of ensuring equity. Well, you know, I would believe you if, I mean, I would be so excited with what you just said if, if the fact that this new experience of protesters made them lose their mind apparently because they have all these processes that they know how to document and they know how to follow, all of a sudden they became um, humans that did something completely different? I don't think so. And so what we have here in my mind is an incongruence between what you're saying, which I would just love to believe is true and what we're experiencing out in the public. We also have to remember what our report said was that we have insufficient documentation uh, related to use of force. Uh, we, we do know that FDCRs are being done. So the characterization that they've lost their minds and, and no longer can fill out force reports or evaluate force reports uh, is, is premature at this moment simply because we just don't have the documentation to assess that. And that's what our report said. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure about what a force report is, but on their website, they say they do not collect data on I'm, any of the protests or us. That's I appreciate the comments and the in the feedback, but I do want to keep it going. There's a, a number yep. of other community comments. So if we can go to the next one, is that is that okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're gonna go next to Dan. Uh, if there's, and then after that, maybe we'll take one more community question and then we'll close it out with some piece up questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Dan Handelman again with Portland Cop Watch. Uh, and just in terms, I posted in the chat a link to a uh, quarterly force report 
the PPB has for over a year included crowd control data in the quarterly reports. So this whole thing about annual report only is not accurate. Uh, and you yourselves in the COCL report said you, there is no distinction in the agreement between violence at a protest and violence on an everyday interaction. So the fact that they've separated out at all is inappropriate. Um, I also want to point out that the PPB, according to you, has not even finished their annual report for this year. The only year they had it in on time was last year since 2012 when their uh, agreement was signed. Um, the uh, traffic stop data that you pointed out uh, is coming out on a quarterly basis. The 2018 report was supposed to have a breakout of the gun violence reduction team and its former self. Um, that was never updated. Um, the 2019 data has still have not been published and it's October of this year now. Um, uh, I just also want to point out in terms of your reluctance to do anything about reanalyzing the 4.4% uh, figure about the budget. This is a draft report. You have the ability to change that if you find better numbers, and I think you should. Um, the person who was shot at the court tail end of the second quarter had a mental health issue and a disability, and you don't mention that. It's, you only give vague information about that. Uh, and then talking about the de-escalation of a couple of cases where people were not harmed, that's really nice to know. But, you know, McDonald's serves 7 billion hamburgers, and one person dies of food poisoning, that's significant. Um, the person didn't get hit by a bullet, by the way, for people who don't know that. Uh, there's a mention about the Citizen Review Committee not necessarily following their standard of review because somebody said, I can see both sides have merit. Well, that's one way to analyze whether or not a reasonable person could come to the findings. So I don't think that's an appropriate analysis of CRC's um, discussions. Um, you, there's no mention at all about the lack of officer ID that the chief allowed them to cover over their name badges and put numbers on. I think that happened uh, within this quarter that you're just reviewing. Uh, I know it did because it happened in the previous quarter and continued. And that's one of the also reasons that IPR is having a hard time identifying who the officers are because they don't wear their name tags anymore, uh, which is out, an outrage. Um, and I uh, echo, uh, Maxine Bernstein raised this question too, but I had it on my list already. There are 485 officers who haven't met the minimum standards of training according to the state of Oregon. Does that mean that they're not certified police officers anymore? And if so, why are they still uh, part of our police force? You want a quick response to that? Well, Dan, you always bring up good points. Um, the uh, I, I, I can't respond to all of them right now. I, it, there's too much here. We've made notes of them though, and we will respond to them uh, in time. I just, this thing about the budget still keeps bugging me because you say, well, you better come up with better numbers. Well, it sounds like we're not in the business of coming up with better numbers. I'm coming up with accurate numbers. So we'll see if that needs to change or not. I'm uh, sorry, but you, you cherry picked the, the lowest Seeming number. There's another number in that same paragraph of that same article that says we have the 19th lowest spending in terms of actual dollars spent. So you could have chosen that one, but you chose the one that made it look like we're spending the least. So that was a decision you made, regardless of whether or not you're going to reanalyze the numbers. Okay. Well, that was the number that they used to characterize across all the agencies, but that's all right. We'll look at it again. Uh, we should probably get more feedback from everybody else, I mean, rather than me answering all those, unless you want me to. Well, no, but I would like to um, either view or uh, uh, maybe Mary Claire can speak to just the, the question that's brought up a couple of times now about the 480 officers and what the implications of them are that haven't received this training. Um, yeah, Mary Claire, you want to respond to that because I think they have to have it by the end of the year. Is that right? Or you're seeking an extension from the state to uh, an exception, is that what the Bureau is trying to do? DPST itself was closed during the pandemic as well. So um, the Bureau is not, police, Portland is not the only Bureau that is having difficulty uh, meeting. There are certain requirements um, for um, like, you know, having officers licensed, uh, you know, and they're a three year and a one year. And so right now uh, they are not, out of compliance, they are um, able to function as 
law enforcement. Um, DPST is there, several of them will be short a couple, but DPST is going to give an extension to anybody in the state who is short because of the, um, and it, all the 485 did receive half of the training. So the only piece that those uh, uh, 485 are missing are in fact the skills part where they actually act out or practice the skills such as um, control tactics or what have you. So um, they did, we did at least give them half of the in-service by pu putting the classes on LMS. And so all of those officers uh, that didn't get to attend in person uh, finished the classroom portion uh, by May 31st. So um, the only thing they're missing is those, uh, those hours that would have been, and those are going to be done, as uh, Kokel noted, at, beginning in January in the 2021 in-service. And just to follow up with that, those 485 officers that have incomplete um, training, some of them or probably all of them are out on the streets, correct? Well, I, I, I just want to caution to say that not, not all 485 may be short of um, training things because it's over a three year period. So um, over three years, you have to have X number of, you know, uh, credits and Brian, if if you're uh, want to speak to this, you know, uh, feel free to jump in. But um, yeah. there are certain requirements from DPST that you have to do on an annual basis, and the rest are within three years. You have to complete certain things. So I wouldn't say that all 400. I couldn't say right now that all 485 are 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 short of the credits that they need this year. But but some of them are though. So the, the police bureau provides training that exceeds the minimum standard for the state. Uh, when I was in the training division, I believe it was 84 hours of training was required in a three year period. And historically, the police bureau has provided 40 hours of in service every year. So that would be 120 hours of training in any three year period. And so officers, while they may not have received a, a portion of their ongoing training, uh, I would have to defer to the training division how many people will be in jeopardy of uh, uh, not meeting the, the three-year state standards. So the police bureau is broken into, at one point was broken into thirds, and every year one-third of our officers came up for review of the, on that three-year cycle. And so I would have to defer to the training division on how many officers specifically won't meet their training in this three-year cycle, but it's not going to be all 485. Thank you. Um, being very cognizant of time, I do want to give this last 10 minutes to our PSEP members. Um, uh, drop your questions if your community members into the um, chat, if you have additional ones. And then uh, Dr. Rosenbaum and Dr. Christoph, if y'all can just make notes of those and um, respond to them on a separate time. I know Dr. Rosenbaum, you've taken some other questions that you weren't able to answer a little earlier as well. Uh, but to get us started with our PSEP, we will go with, uh, Vadim, then Elliot, and then Amy. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, uh, two, two questions uh, the, backing up on each other. Uh, the first one, uh, would it be safe to say that the top three reasons why noncompliance was found was the coronavirus effects, um, the, the protests slash riots, as well as the um, uh, budgetary issues? Um. Let's see, am I on? Yeah. Um, yeah, Vadim, I think those um, those would be the top three um, because the management decision is linked to the budget. So um, I, I think that would be management slash budget would be the third one. Yes. And, and so let's say uh, tomorrow, for the sake of argument, the, those three issues were eliminated, the COVID was cured, uh, the okay. downtown protests ended and the budget was adequate. Have you seen any systemic issues uh, out of the non-compliance part of the report that would continue, that you feel would continue absent those circumstances? Um, that's a really good question. Um, most of the systems are in place as, as we talked about before. They require, require some revisions. I mean, the, the, 
the fear that the protests could come back or continue on requires the Bureau to make adjustments there. And I think they have. We need more details about all of those changes, but uh, in responding more quickly to both on the street and in terms of their reviewing of force and that sort of thing. Uh, training, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that one, if, if um, they, it, it really, I haven't done an analysis, a staffing analysis entirely of the Portland Police Training Bureau, training division, uh, to see exactly how much um, staffing that would require. Uh, but because there are such major constraints now and they've lost, you know, they've been, their budget has been cut. And uh, so, um, but I think they have the systems in place. They have the needs assessment. They have the training plan. They have, they, they are giving, they have systems in place to make training work. Uh, but you just can't stop the training like that for an extended period and expect everything to just go smoothly for a while. And it's just like, you know, uh, the, anyway, I don't want to go on and on. It, it, just like our nation isn't going to recover from this pandemic tomorrow either. It's, it's, it's going to take time, but uh, it, it's just harder right now when they, they're very hard. And I don't want to get in the middle of the budget thing, except to say, if you can come up with a cheaper way of doing things, great. I, I think it's difficult to predict um, if all of those things went away, would there be any issues? I think one of the things that we, we can say and that we do say in this report is those three things impacted uh, the, their operations. Um, they, they, they had an impact, um, but I'm not sure if, it's, if we can predict in the future what would happen. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna to go to Elliot and Amy. Just uh, want you to be conscious we are really tight on time. Yeah, Dennis, thanks for the report. So, I mean, in response to that last question about what they could have done, I, I think Dan has suggested in the chat and other people have suggested if they weren't sending out so many police to brutalize protesters, they would have fewer reports to do and they would have more resources to do the rest of their work. And my question is really about a philosophical question. So um, I too was um, interested to see that your report found the city out of compliance, but when you drill down into how that you found the city out of compliance, it's basically they didn't do their paperwork on time. They didn't do the training. Um, and in part, you can't make a determination about the use of force because they haven't provided the data. But anyone who looks at the videos, who looks at the data on 100 uses of tear gas in June knows that there was an extreme use of force. Um, and you know, until it's investigated, I understand you can't um, make a determination precisely, but I think that um, it's clear that all of this use of force should be considered. And so if you're a citizen in the city, what you're experiencing is in the city is a dramatic increase of use of force. And I feel like the report should in some way reflect that, whereas now it, it focuses on the paperwork. Um, and then the broader context in terms of the regular systems outside of the protests, um, you know, if you look at traffic stops, if you look at use of force data, it not only continues to be um, highly discriminatory, but your own data and the PPV data suggests it's getting worse in the last quarter from 17 to 18% from um, first quarter to second quarter in terms of the number of black Portlanders stopped. Um, the use of force data, you know, the overall numbers minus the protests go down. But if you look at who is actually those use of force incidents are being used against, 25% of them in the second quarter were black people, 47% were houseless, 21 um, or, and 21% were people experiencing a mental health crisis. These numbers are wildly disproportionate to their presence in the population. And I think there should be some recognition of that in the report beyond simply 
the um, the fact that you know they didn't turn their paperwork in on time. And I know this is an outcomes versus training thing, but frankly, if you say they've been doing the training right and have the systems in place since 2014 to do this, and we're now in 2020 and we still see these discriminatory outcomes, the training is not working. And that worries me in terms of the settlement agreement, because if the settlement agreement is just looking at the training and the training is not producing the results we want, either in terms of use of force or discriminatory policing, then we have a problem. In terms of PSAP, um, you know, you brought this up, mentioned this before. Um, it's true that the city has met with, um, met with us ad nauseum. We've been going to meetings all the time. But the fact that five, uh, four out of five of our reports since the end of May um, were not responded to. And as of today, we've only received one response um, to the qualified immunity thing, which just came in a few days ago after four months. Four of them, after repeated attempts to ask the city for a response, we have not received any response for. So if PSEP is actually functioning and not just checking a box in the settlement agreement, you would think the city would not only want to meet with us, but would actually want to respond in substance to our recommendations. And after we've brought this up time and again, they um, simply have not. In fact, that other recommendation, which we finally got the uh, uh, approval for, the official notice of, that was actually signed on June 24th. So these papers are just sitting around the office somewhere. There seems to be no evidence that the city is either considering or taking seriously piece up recommendations. Okay, that's important to hear. Uh, thank you, Elliot. That's you make a lot of good points there, and we've we've taken some notes. Um, you know, uh, and uh, this last one you've mentioned about the recommendations. I didn't. I've done a little homework on that, but I really do feel that the city needs to respond more to that. Some of the problem is you, you apparently PSEP has been sending them to the mayor's office and the police department may, uh, and doesn't always get involved in those, that some are more appropriate for them. Uh, and some are outside, I guess, involve the DA's office in, in some of these matters. So, um, I, you know, but I, I'm not going to make up excuses for them. I think we will look into that more carefully and, and find out where everything is. Well, none and, of the none of the recommendations I'm referring to, they were all directed to the mayor. And as police commissioner, he um, is the one who's responsible for responding. For distributing them, yes. Okay. And responding. So a lot has been said this evening. We got one more person. We got Amy, who's going to give us the last question to close it out. Um, and then we'll yeah, mine is going to be simple and kind of painless. I'm hoping that um, in a culture of change, the world of um, mental illness has kind of been morphed into a dual conversation called behavioral health. And I would very much appreciate it if you could um, change your wording and your reports to reflect the language that the population I serve is really wanting to, to use. And that would be behavioral health challenges or in a behavioral health crisis. There's two ways you can use the term to reflect someone. So um, I really would appreciate that. That's all I wanted to ask. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Tom, we can do that, can't we? Yep, thank you. Yeah. Definitely. Good job, Amy. Yeah. I need to use your microphone. Thank you on that. Um, I want to thank Dr. Rosenbaum and Dr. Christoph for spending these uh, last two hours with us and answering all these questions and giving us this report. I uh, appreciate all the community members um, who shared their input and spoke their truth into our PSAP members as well. Um, only thing I would add, just kind of in, in recapping it, is uh, I think Ann had just mentioned, uh, based off of Elliot's points, is just the continued our discussion about outcomes um, and uh, the response to the work that we've been producing on PSEP. And also, I, I don't, a lot of this that was said tonight 
was inferred from, we're trying to make assumptions or inferences about the Portland Police Bureau's decision on why things happen. And I think a follow-up conversation needs to be had at least internally, but I know the public would wanna hear it too, and hear directly from the Portland Police Bureau as to why these things, um, why they didn't keep up with training, why they didn't keep up with the, the forest reports beyond just what things happen in the world. Um, and I'm particularly concerned with, especially given that the Department of Justice didn't approve anything, why they would risk substantial compliance being this close to being done and not try and find any possible way to keep in with that. So that um, is, is puzzling to me. So I think what a great next step in addition to um, Dr. Rosenbaum, and Dr. Christoph, if y'all could please um, follow up with the questions that you, you did receive. Um, I think that PSEP should consider meeting with the chief or inviting the chief to our meeting to talk specifically about these lapses in um, substantial compliance and hear directly from them about why the decisions were made they were. Um, but I will say based on everything here that it is a lot of stuff going on. That's just how I categorize it. Um, and the final thing that I just did want to mention is that today would be George Floyd's 47th birthday. Um, so just sending him energy and his family and everybody else who's um, um, fighting to, to live in our country. So thank you all for being here. I don't know, Dr. Rosenbaum, Dr. Christoph, you have any closing comments? Uh, oh, just to thank you all. These were some very good comments tonight and good suggestions. So we will digest those and incorporate some of those and respond to them as we always do uh, publicly on the website, in addition to our revised report. Thank you. And uh, the community can count on PSIP to continue this. It's not a conversation that just ends here. We'll be following up in our subcommittees and our steering committee with, with this work and with other work around policing. And our, our next uh, full body meeting is at the end of this month, on October 27th on Zoom at 5 to uh, 8 p.m. We've extended it back to our three hour time because there's so much going on. So thank you all for being here tonight and we'll see you soon. Thank you all. Bye, Kenna. Bye.